Okay, here we go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode, Pound for Pound Boxing Report, episode 225. I am your host, Michael. Um, joining me this week, as usual, I'm Gail from Communities Digital News, Jacob from Jab Hook, uh, Daniel from The Inscriber, I'm Gus from Corruption and, Bo- Corruption and Boxing. What's going on, ladies and gents? Hey, we've got a lot to talk about this week. Yeah, so we're on a it lot. Early, early Monday appearance. Yeah, might as well get it while I got some time and while it's fresh in everyone's mind. Uh, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show, podcast, as well as blog discussing all things boxing. The model is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. You want to find out all information regarding Pound for Pound Box Report, the blog page is the best place to go to. P4PBoxingReport.wordpress.com. Check the right of the blog page. You can find links to our multiple channels all over social media, as well as where to listen to the show on all available platforms that carry a podcast, uh, minus Spotify. Um, let's get the show started. Uh, going to Japan first, uh, World Boxing Super Series uh, Bantamweight and Junior Welterweight Tournaments kicked off. This past uh, Sunday, well, yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, in Nagoya, Japan, I want to focus on the Bantamweight uh, opener first. Um, Naoya Inoue, who moved up to 118 pounds um, earlier this year, uh, defeating Jamie McDonald to win the WBA bout. Uh, he kicked off the Bantamweight tournament by fighting um, former uh, WBA champion um, Juan Carlos Payano. I mean, listen, um, I, I, I named this name this podcast particular episode monster mash because that's what annoy has been doing um when i wrote about this fight with three kings boxing i thought because payano is a tough guy uh he's a durable guy he's a rough guy that it may take some time for a new way to uh solve him out to solve him and if eventually finish him off but i was wrong i mean Hell, and I'll, I'll go to you on this one. Um, first, uh, Gus, uh, first combination, first power punch he landed, lights out. Uh, he knocked down, he knocked out Jimmy McDonald in 122 seconds. He was like, let me end this one shorter. 72nd, first round KO. Uh, the myth, uh, the legend, the reputation of Naoya Onue, uh continues. Um, is this the most dynamic, devastating boxer in the world right now? I think secretly somewhere, you know, he must have renegotiated his contract and he's getting paid by the second now. <laughs> in, in terms of, yeah, in terms of what he's doing in a minute, these lower weight ranks where there's always been a perception that you know, they just fight in sort of one one dimensional styles, you know, specifically on volume of punches and they don't have the ability to uh, or, you know vary their game or resort to plan B or C you know fight even on the back foot but um, in a way he's, 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 his power is you know carrying in fact he's becoming a little bit more devastating uh, it's it's a surprise to some people but um you know we've got to be reflective you know I mean the, the, the opponents, um, I gave Payano a little bit of respect, Mike, but he, he didn't have any significant power that would have even troubled Noya. So I always felt that um, eventually he would have get him. But uh, given that he's an explosive sort of fighter and he starts very quickly um, and he's certainly booed by his home crowd, so the possibility of an early, of an early stoppage stroke knockout, you know, that was always foreseeable. Um, but the way he did it in this fight, now, that Payano has southpaw, um, his option in, in this fight, given that he, he, he certainly didn't have the power, was to, you know, outbox him, try and frustrate him fighting in sort of Yokohama. Um, so he was, he was quite busy with his jab, um, one or two long left hands as well. Uh, so he, he was trying to command, you know, the middle of the ring, you know, be a little bit aggressive, which, yeah, in hindsight is, you can, you can be critical, but he, he's got to try and, you know, say to no, you know, I mean, I, I'm the career long, you know, Bantam where you're moving up, you're the smaller guy, I'm naturally bigger, so I'm going to have to try and be a little bit aggressive, you know, 
you know, try and gain you respect as well. But what Inoue did from, you know, from 60 seconds to 70 was, you know, the way he just navigated in, um, he used his upper body more. It wasn't, so it wasn't telegraphed in terms of the, the feints. Drew a lead from Piano, got inside Piano's right hand um, with, a, you know, a beautiful long sort of left hand. Now, at that stage, Piano's, um, his, his left hand was tight to his chin, which is in the correct position. But the left hand from Inoue snapped his head back significantly. And what Piano should have done from a technical standpoint is kept that left hand, you know, up at his chin, knowing that the right hand would follow. But the instincts of a fighter, he made the fatal error of pulling his left hand back ready to fire a punch <laughs> which is suicide when you think about it so so the entire middle was just perfectly open and uh as in a ways, momentum was already coming forward with the left hand um hence he didn't have much distance with the right hand uh and it, and it was a relatively short right hand but he got you know perfect velocity going into the punch as he's transferring his weight forward um and uh <laughs> you know it, it caught him perfectly and uh you know it, it didn't help that Piano at the back of his head hit the canvas hard as well so naturally that would have sort of exacerbated um you know knocking him out and the you know Ronald McIntosh the <laughs> the UK commentator came up with two classic lines at that stage what did he say he said Piano's ob- eyes are in orbit Spinning like the reels on the fruit machine. <laughs> mm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna split. I was, I'm, I'm gonna split these fights up because we have so many fights to recap. But I want to give everybody an opportunity to talk about this particular fight with Anui and Payano. Uh, uh, starting with you, Gail. Again, um, Gus described basically how uh, Anui set him, set Payano up to land the shot, but. St- uh, as he moved up a new way from 108 to 115 and now 118, the prevailing theme that continues with him, um, his explosiveness and his uh, punching power, again, um, devastating combination to of, of, of hand, foot speed, uh, boxing ability, and power to head and body. Again, um, there's not too many arsenal, not too many guys who have a, fighters who have a greater arsenal in the sport right now than one Anui. They certainly don't. And what Anui also has, in addition to all the physical skills, is his mental acuity. You know, looking back at the fight, Anui reminds me of those kids who could take a Rubik's Cube and just solve it at warp speed right in front of your eyes. You know, 15 seconds, boom, it's done. That's what Anui does. He goes in there, he sizes up what his opponents have to offer and where they're vulnerable as fast as that as that kid ratcheting through that Rubik's Cube. And, you know, 70 seconds later, boom, problem solved, cube down. And you saw his reaction. You know, it was it was the boxing equivalent of dropping the mic. Not in a disrespectful way, just boom, there it is. And for anybody who doubted this guy was going to carry his power up into the higher weight classes, <laughs> you know, I, I, the sky is the limit. And if I am anyone else in this tournament, you know, perhaps short of Zolani Tete, I, I'm thinking, well, okay, <laughs> the writing's on the wall. It was truly an amazing display. Um, For those who did not see the fight, because it was live at an ungodly early hour, especially for the West Coast, uh, the good news is when you have a streaming service like DAZN featuring it, it's there for you to go back and look at. And as for me, I got my whole month's $10 worth with that fight alone. It was that impressive. I'll go to you, uh, Jacob and Daniel, uh, quickly, your reaction to what you saw yesterday. Well, I don't think, Jacob, you saw the fight, but uh, Daniel, uh, your no, reaction. Okay, I, your reaction to what you saw yesterday. 
I saw all 70 seconds of it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I was really impressed. I thought it was going to be a little bit more of a, of a fight. And, you know, he, he caught him, you know, with the perfect, like, you know, kind of combo. And, I mean, you could tell when he hit him, it was, it was over. Um, I mean, credit to Payano. He's tried to get up, but, I mean, he was seriously hurt. Um, you know, I mean, this guy's for real, you know, like there's, you know, it kind of reminded me a lot of, uh, what Tete did in his, uh, championship fight where he, I think he landed like just the one punch and it was over as the fastest, I think, um, uh, championship, uh, fight, uh, time-wise, I think, um, uh, what do you do that like sometime last year or earlier this year? Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah so an, that. that was an 11 second single punch win. The CompuBox, CompuBox stats are one punch, connect percentage 100%, power punches 100%. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, stats, yeah. <laughs> which, which kind of, you know, knowing that and then seeing this and knowing that these two could eventually meet up, it just makes me, uh, of course, salivate, so, uh, you know, at the mouth that, you know, this potential fight could happen. The one thing I would like to see with the new way, though, is I would like to see somebody take him deep and, like, get him into a little bit of a dog fight to see, you know, because I don't know that he's been, I mean, and this is not his fault. I mean, he's blown, been blowing people out, but, you know, I don't know he's been tested or, you know, been put into adversity. And that's where I really see, like, kind of the mental aspect and the strengths of a boxer, if they can kind of get themselves out of adversity and fight through it, kind of like a, a Dogbo did in his fight with Magdalena when he got knocked down early. You know, he was able to come back and stop Magdalena. So, like, I love to see kind of fights like that and, and see really what the whole picture of the boxer is. Oh, your reaction, Daniel. Beautiful, precision, didn't waste any time. And that's a very, very risk, high risk when you're fighting Piano. Just because of the way he works, he's a tough out for almost anybody. But obviously not for a new way because I like the way he high set of the punch. He kept, like just mentioned, he kept the left hand with enough distance where Piano had to pay attention to it. And left himself completely open to land a nice little right hook. And he looks like he knew. He knew halfway as Payano was going down that it was over. He picked it up. He put his hands up. He simply waited and then was able to celebrate. It was nice, quick work. Um, like I said, beating a fighter that... You have to really work to beat. So I'm fully, fully impressed when it comes to Nui on that. I know people have been questioning whether or not why was he always leaving divisions when it seemed like the divisions were getting hot. But he's in a division right now where he's going to be in a really, really good matchup in the finals. Should nothing, should nothing strange happen is him and Tete. It's going to be a fun, fun tournament watching this. And I say, good way to get started listening to Bantamweights. Well, uh, Inoue, what's, what's up next for Inoue? Uh The winner of Emmanuel Rodriguez, as he has a mandatory defense of his, I believe, IBF belt against Jason Maloney in a couple of weeks. Uh, that's a 60 40 fight, in my opinion. Um, I believe that the winner of that, particularly if it's Rodriguez, will give, um, in a way, a tougher fight. Um, I like a, I like what I've seen a lot from um, Rodriguez, especially when he won the title um, earlier this year. But yeah, in a way, um, again, um, this guy has been devastating. Um, most dynamic box in the world today, arguably. Um, astonishing the way um, uh, he's moved up and continued to um, body folks. I mean, we, we talk about what Pacquiao did moving up from all those weights. Um, he wasn't destroying folks, not in this manner, uh, with such ease. Um, so, yeah, uh, kudos to him anyway. And, yeah, that fight, that potential fight with him and um, Tete down the road, if it happens. Um, oh, boy. Um, 
move on to some other bouts, um, particularly on that Japan card. I don't know if anybody else saw the uh, uh, Kinshiro, uh, Milan Melendo, um, Relic, Troy Noski. Um, if so, continue to chime in. I'm going to give a brief recap on that fight. Uh, we talked about Kenshiro Melendo uh, last week. Uh, Gus and I in particular was very excited about that bout. Uh, I said that if Kenshiro were to box, that he would win. Um, and he did just that. Um, he exceeded my expectations in terms of what he did. He boxed very well. Uh, he continues to get better and better with each fight. Um, there are some flaws about him. Uh, I don't like how he at times keeps his head up too much and his chin is not always tucked. But um, from a skill perspective, uh, very fast hands, very fast feet. He he kept moving, kept giving uh, Milan Melendo angles all night long. And Melendo got caught fighting at one speed, uh, did not really adjust. And uh, the old bugaboo Gus with Melendo cuts uh, came yeah. into play once again, unfortunately. Uh, the fight was stopped due to cuts, due to a, uh, a bad gash. Um, yes. I want to say over his um, left eye. Uh, yes. But yet and still, it would not have mattered to me. Uh, Shiro was just that good on the night. Uh, he keeps getting better and better and better. Um, if you saw the fight, Gus, I, he I heard you comment. Your quick thoughts. Yeah, I think one other thing I noticed, Mike, you know, Shiro looks a lot bigger than... Melendo, and I think Melendo struggled with that, the physicality and the size, particularly the uh, the length of of Shiro. And it's what interesting, was, if, you, if you don't mind me interrupting, Gus, yeah. and it's interesting you mention that because Shiro came and made the weight with ease, while Melendo, he had to, uh, he missed weight on his first opportunity. Um, he had to go re-weigh weigh in once t a couple hours later, he made the weight, but still, it's interesting you mentioned that. Yeah, just looking at you know, looking at the frame of both of them, Shira to me um, looked definitely a lot bigger. Um, but what Melendo struggled with was that um, he, he was trying to counter with, with his jab to the body, and it was a good tactic. He's quite explosive like that. He, he tends to do that a lot. He, he's quite patient. He'll try and calculate the patterns, and he'll always try and counter to the body. Um, he doesn't. What he do, what he does he he doesn't lean he actually he will actually bend from the knees and bend so he's almost vertically down and then he shoots a, a relatively straight jab to the body and it's good because his head is then off that center axis so he's not getting uh, countered with a right hand if he's coming forward but Shira didn't really allow him to do it to do much more he stuck to his fundamentals it was pretty much a jab straight right hand jab straight right hand, switch the angles. Um, anytime Melinda would try and come forward, you know, his he's objective was obviously to target the body. Shira very nimble on his feet. You know, what is he, 26 years old? So, you know, he still has that flexibility, that dexterity. So he is able to evade punches like that. Well, he does definitely need to improve his fundamentals a little bit on his defense. You're right, with the head uh, at times, you know, Far too vertical. The gloves are not protecting the head. So yeah, he he, 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 has a, he seems to fight with wide hands at times. You think he yeah. gets caught with with straight shots up the middle. He needs to watch that as um, he continues on and face better and better competition and bigger punching and bigger competition. He could get caught and hurt that way. What it is, Mike? Yeah, exactly. He, he's got what they call that that T guard, and that T guard is something that Francisco Estrada uses as well. So. It's a guard more at the side, so it's better to protect against hooks. But against straight punches, you're susceptible. But that that T guard in 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 what Estrada was saying, it allows him to fire left hands quickly to the body and straight jabs without bending the arm too much, straight up top, so it's less telegraphed. Something I think a lot of you know Xanta fighters tend to, tend to sort of use. So it's it's more that type of a guard. But yeah. It, if, he, if he's at close range and he doesn't really want to be at close range with, say, a Tito Acosta, somebody like that, um, who can fire punches, you know, quick, short punches up through the middle, you know, that'll be the ultimate test. And it's interesting Tito is fighting, you know, next week because I, I'd say I'd say Shiro and, and Acosta, for me, that that's 
one and two. And if they can get that one on, you know, with a little bit of Hecky Butler in the middle, little trifecto, beautiful. Indeed, indeed. Um, I want to move on to the uh, Kill Relic Tro Troynoski bout. Um, I'll give a brief summary of that. Uh, I had questions about uh, Troynoski's uh, mental uh, following that 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 devastating um, KO he suffered uh, a couple of years ago to uh, 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 Ndongo. Um, this fight was very simple for me when it came to Troynoski. He's basically stuck to the basics. Um, kept the high guard, kept applying uh, constant pressure, uh, basic one, two, one, two, three, uh, body punches here and there. Um, and I don't know if, uh, if, if Tronoski is, is, is shell-shocked or what, but whenever Relic hit him with a kind of semi-hard punch, um, he reacted not too good in my opinion. He just didn't do enough while uh, uh, Relic kept working, kept the output going, and wasn't the most aesthetically pleasing fight, but uh, Relic, he basically did what he had to do to win this fight, and he didn't do much, little more than just the basics. He didn't do much, not, nothing more than the basics. Uh, Troy Noski didn't give him anything to trouble him at all, and Relic ran away with this bout, in my opinion, with relative ease. Um, I think he's going to fight the fight with the winner of um, Progress. Who is Regis, Regis Progress fighting next? Flanagan. Flanagan. I think he's going to fight that winner. The winner of that fight next. I think he'll be in much tougher uh, uh, fight, particularly if it's um, Progress. But yeah, um, this was ho hum to me. Pretty mimp um, output because of what Tronowski didn't do, and he didn't. He didn't push. He didn't push Kill Relic at all, in my opinion. Um, let's move on to the Chicago card. Um, go to you, Gail. Let's start with um, Jesse Vargas, um, Tomas Delorme. Um, this fight was just, this is a case where you have B-level competition, in my opinion, produce A-level effort in terms of action. Uh, back and forth all the way. Uh, both fighters got hurt. Um, I think Vargas went down uh, maybe a couple times in this bout. Uh, a draw on the scorecard. But uh, surprisingly um, exciting fight, uh, arguably the most exciting fight of the weekend, Gil. Well, if you don't count the 70 seconds of sheer exhilaration we saw <laughs> from Inoue. But, yeah, you know, the meh reaction you had for Relic and Troynovsky, which I completely agree with, was the thinking I had going into seeing this is the main event. And I thought, really? The Zone USA's debut main event and this is what they've got okay surprisingly good fight a fight that kept me in the chair eyes forward wondering what was going to happen because it was the right matchup are either of these guys exceptional no but they both had their moments in their career they both had something on the line and they both delivered really good performances so that the fight became quite a nail biter. Delorme was knocked down by Vargas um, for a single 10 8 round. And as we were coming down the stretch and it got close, you know, all of us started thinking, okay, that knockdown's going to be the difference in this fight. And it would have been, except with seconds. On the clock in the 12th round, Delorme buzzed Vargas hard enough to make, to make him stumble and touch the glove to the canvas. He got counted out and the fight was over. And you saw the look on Vargas's face like, damn, I, I'll kick myself if that's what lost me the fight. And sure enough, that made the difference that one slight brush of the glove on the canvas caused two of the cards to be a draw. So you had a majority draw. Now, was it a great fight that we want to see again in a rematch? I think I'm probably good, but uh, given their other options, um, a rematch isn't the dumbest idea. Fans ringside enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. 
everyone I talked to had virtually the same reaction, which was, well, for a fight with really, really low expectations of any entertainment, it was damn good. So there is something to be said for a fight exceeding expectations at whatever level, and this one did. Um, let's go to the light heavyweight bout, the long awaited return of um, Arthur Berti BF. Uh, fought Column Johnson. I'll go to you on this one, uh, 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 Daniel. Listen, Berti BF won um, round four. Power, uh, physical strength was too much in the end for Johnson. But at the same time, um, after uh, dominating the first round, Berti BF, he got shook up and put down by Johnson. Um, were you surprised? I know you're not surprised that Berta Biev won, but were you surprised at that shaky second round from Berta Biev? A little bit. A little bit, because the way Callum Johnson landed that left hook, he's not, it's not a punch that you normally would see Berta Biev allowed to land on him. But he also had to take into account the fact that this is also a lot of inactivity catching up to Berta Biev. He hasn't been very active in the ring for a while bit. Now, granted, some of it has been an injury, but some of it has been his own choice, His, him battling Yvonne Michelle to get out of that promotional deal. And Callum Johnson, like I said, I'll, you'll say this, he may be far away, but in the UK scene, he is, I think he is the British and he is the Commonwealth champion. So he's at least European level best in that area. The issue probably is going to be with Berturbiev is he weathered the storm pretty well after that knockdown. He didn't let himself get careless. He didn't try to come back and throw bombs right away. He tried to reestablish himself, waited until Callum Johnson opened up enough where he landed the right hand in that fourth round and just let him droop into the ground but it was a good that's it was good showing for Callum Johnson you can, you can tell that he'll be a secondary player he's gonna be somebody's decent step up it's not gonna he's not a world beater but he's gonna be somebody that you probably gonna have to beat on the way to becoming a world beater and for Berturbiev he has to get back into the ring pretty soon like his like I said, part of part of it is just him getting caught a little bit, but part of it is just also inactivity catching up to him. Okay, did anybody see the the um, Daniel Roman uh, Gavin McDonald fight? If if not, if so, uh, please give some commentary on it. Wow, that was it. Uh, nobody, nobody. Okay, else. I'll just wonder because if not, I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick commentary. Yeah, let's go with uh, okay, your thoughts. Um, Gavin McDonald, Mike. Um, we spoke a little bit about him last week, and he showed why that you know he's quite a. I think he's a terrible fighter. I think he made two fundamental mistakes in this fight. Number one, as the taller man, he was conceding his height throughout bending at the waist and leaning forward. And number two, he foolishly chose to exchange with a fighter when Gavin himself has absolutely no power. Um, Roman, neat, compact, sort of tidy boxer, was consistently to come, able to come over, you know, Gavin's left hand with, you know, right hand. He had better punch variety. Um, but the bizarre thing that, I, I don't know what quite happened is, Halfway through the fight, it looked like Roman's gas tank had just depleted. He started winging away wider punches. Just looked tired, and, and, and McDonald got a little bit of a reprieve. I think he may have won one or two rounds. Um, but just out of nowhere, Roman come back with that, that right hand. So I'm not sure whether he deliberately set him up to try and do that or, genu or whether he was genuinely tired. The way I look at it is I look at the a fighter's accuracy during those periods and you know, Roman's activity had curtailed and he's, he's he started um, going to wider punches and that's always a, a telltale sign of a fighter who's tired. You know, wider, winging sort of wider, some more cruder punches. So going forward, I can say, Mike, that, you know, stamina might be, 
his one main deficiency. Apart from that, he's he's a reasonably good boxer. But um, yeah, it, I'm I'm not sure whether you know he can go a full twelve with a you know a fifty fifty fighter who has a bit of power who can certainly has the work rate more of a pressure fighter that can almost bully him. I think he that that might be his kryptonite. Um, before when we talked about this when we pre previewed this fight last week, I described um Daniel Danny Roman as a um, earnest, um, honest, uh, hardworking guy. He does a lot of things well. Nothing great about him. Um, that was basically the case in in, in this fight. Uh, Gavin McDonald. He tried. He was willing, but just overall, not in just terms of what you mentioned about um, um, style wise. Um, I just think in overall, in terms of talent and, and physicality, uh, he just was not going to be enough. Uh, Danny Roman is just way too consistent. And you mentioned Gus how uh, you see some uh, problems. Um, lying ahead, should he fight a guy uh, who has more power and who applies pressure and who's at the level of him stamina wise? That's why I want to see Romine um, Isaac Dogbe. Um, Dogbe has been calling him out. Um, let's hope it happens uh, 2019 because that has a chance to be a really, really good fighter. Good fight, excuse me. Uh, what you were mentioning, Gus, Dogbe presents those kind of problems. Um, not the tallest guy, but he's very strong physically. Um, he can punch, and I've never seen an issue of him getting um, really, really tired. Tired, um, and he has full confidence now. Um, on paper, um, that should be an outstanding fight. Let's hope it happens in 2019. Uh, I've always said, I said when we began the show, uh, when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. So I guess. We have to talk about this, uh, Big Baby Miller, um, Adam <laughs> Adamic. I mean, listen, um, my I said last week, um, the thing that um, I was most interested in was his weight, uh, Big Baby. Um, 317 pounds, guys. 317. On the, on really? The scale, on the scale. What was he Saturday night, do you think? Who knows? Hi. And he, he, he did what he had to do. Uh, he blew Adamic out. It was easy work. Everybody knew it going going in. But really, again, 317, guys. Really? You know, the one thing Miller does that, speaking from a public relations perspective, since that's what skills pay my bills, he doesn't apologize for it. He owns it. He says, hey, I, I like fighting bigger. I'm good. It's the heavyweight division. Doesn't make any damn difference. I don't have to, you know, his certain number on the scale. I I like it this way I am, built by cheeseburgers. I mean, he at least doesn't shy away from the topic. He owns it. Hell, the DAZN backstage crew walked up to him, and they have something they call a DAZN calzone, and they've got the DAZN logo burned into the top they handed it to him before the weigh-in he takes a big ass bite out of it but you know he so far it's worked for him now he's going to run into an athletic buzzsaw and it's going to be a big problem until then yeah you know, he is working all right he's entertaining folks i mean if he truly thinks that's where he fights best at you know God bless. Carry on, man. I think eventually it's going to kill him stamina-wise. That's a hell of a lot of poundage to have to move around the ring when you're trying to set up punches. And if you got somebody any more agile than Adamic, who's the, who, as you say, is there to be fit hit, he's going to be in trouble. But some little piece of me thinks, oh, you know, wouldn't you love to have seen Big Baby Miller and Chris Ariola. Dream fight. Yeah, I don't know, good in a good way or a bad way. <laughs> in a train, you know, sometimes a train wreck's fun to watch. You don't want to see one every day, and you don't want anyone to get seriously hurt. And the one positive you can say is that Adamic, you know, didn't suffer a multi-round beating which is, I think, what everyone was really concerned about. Uh, I, I, I don't know what's uh, more farcical, this fight 
or the fact that they're talking about uh, Big Baby fighting uh, uh, Frez Akendo, who's um, unboxing AARP. Uh, again, you any know, quick word you, on this? You know, you know, Mike, that, that fight for me should have never been sanctioned. And the only reason why right, they did exactly. is, because, is because Adamic is, is Polish and, and we know Chicago has a large Czech population, so they would come. It was a ticket selling venture, but that much weight discrepancy, you're putting sort of health in serious jeopardy. You know, that was a disgrace for me. I mean, 90 pound difference 90 90 pounds. Pounds. on the scales, on the scales, remember. Um, you know, and it speaks to the question which we can debate on a future show, which I do think is worth the discussion. Do we need to split the heavyweight division into regular and super? Because that, that's insane. They both made weight. They're both in the division properly. There was nothing illegal going on. There was, you know, nothing according to the rules was a problem. It wasn't like one guy blew through the weight limit. Um, and we all hate that. But then you got a situation like this, you know, and in all due fairness, that is a problem. Yeah, but isn't uh, Ad Adamic, Adamic is, a, is more of a cruiserweight. I mean, if he wants to move up to fight the big boys, that's on him. I don't, I don't think you can make a super heavyweight division because I don't think there's enough fighters to make that. You know, Big Baby, me and Big Baby suffer from the same disease. We're both <laughs> big boned. So, <laughs> You're not that big boned, my friend. I mean, you could eat, you could eat day and night and... It ain't happening like that. Holy no, I, I, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. But, but yeah, I, I just think like if you have a super heavyweight division, it's going to be hard to. It's going to be kind of like how um, some of the problems with the women's divisions have, where they don't have enough fighters, like you know, competitive fighters to be in that in that right. class. Right. Well, you know, maybe you, maybe you broaden cruiserweight a little bit, just a little. I don't know. I yeah, but they brought in cruiserweight from one ninety to two hundred uh, about ten years ago. Or so, how much do you how much do you want to extend the cruiserweight limit? Uh, you know, it wouldn't need to be much. Although you're right in this case, if Adama can't get you know below, he was at what two twenty, two twenty and change. Yep. You'd have to have the weight limit up pretty far for him to make it. And part of that is his age. You know, he was making cruiser weight fine. So you you get up in, you know, into the forty range, you're going to have trouble making weight, and that's why he's sitting there in the heavyweight division. Plus, that's where more money is, or at least ha has been until the ascent of that division recently. And Adamic was making surprisingly good money fighting in Poland. He's fought the, his last four or five bouts have all been in Poland. They sell out. They still love him. So hopefully this was his swan song, or maybe he'll have, you know, a nice walk-off bout in Poland and call it a career. Yeah, I mean, I think Gus, Gus hit him in the head, though. I mean, they shouldn't have let him fight to begin with. and We no. wouldn't be having this discussion. No, they shouldn't have had it, but you know what? This is also, um, this is pretty much classic Eddie. This is classic Eddie Hearn. Like, he has a fighter... You promise the fighter something. It looks like you're not going to give him something, so you got to keep him busy. Yeah, he wants to. He wants to try and get Callum Johnson killed. He wants to get Adamic killed. Yeah, I think you're a great promoter. Yeah, <laughs> and that and that and that's still t and that's the bad thing about this when it comes to this when it comes to this. He he, he wants to put on as what he considers deep cards to justify. You paying ten dollars a month for a service when you're only going to watch it for certain fights. I'm like, people, people will buy the zone just for Anthony Joshua. People will buy it just for the World Boxing Super Series now. So you don't have to put on these other fights unless you, like I said, in this case, a big baby. You promised him a Joshua fight. It doesn't look like you're going to give him a Joshua fight. So you have to keep him busy somehow, just like pretty much like with Luis Ortiz. You sign Luis Ortiz and have Ortiz thinking, oh, okay, now I can get the fight with Joshua. And then you keep him busy with two do with Malik Scott in another domestic fight. That's just the way Eddie rolls. 
I don't think nobody's buying the zone for Joshua, not according to the recent figures. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, I want to ask you something very quickly regarding that fight. You know, I mean, you're the, you're the sort of health, health sort of fitness expert over here now. What exactly is Big Baby Miller consuming that allows him to put on that much weight? You know, 20, 30, 40 pounds. <laughs> Cheeseburgers, but not, eh? But not restrict his movement that up to the extent where he's able to train for a little bit. And he and he, and he he can throw quite a fair punches. He can go the part, 12 rounds as well. Part of it, he's a natural athlete and he has natural stamina, right? He thinks that because he has that, that he can consume whatever he wants and gets away with it. You don't have to tend to diet uh, uh, to really, he don't have to contend to diet. He don't have to, to eschew with certain things away in terms of conditioning. Um, I, doubt, I doubt if he runs much, to be honest with you, Gus. I doubt if, his, if he does any real serious cardio. He prop, His cardio is probably sparring. And that's it. Um, because well, hell, man, it, it would kill his knees to run. Yeah. I mean, can you no, imagine the, right. the torque of that he, weight right. on a man's knees? It's not, he should not be running. He should be in a uh, pool or anything. He probably, I mean, specifically, he, probably, he, probably, he probably doesn't do that either. Um, if he did any serious, serious cardio, like running, um, jogging, jogging, stairs, or just on the track, um, his tendons would be all kinds of messed up over time. So his cardio was probably consistent, consist only of uh, sparring and 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 that's it. He probably lifts a, a good bit of weight as well, which keeps that um, as we all know, muscle weighs more than fat, so that probably keeps his weight up as well. And just what he eats, what he eats, he doesn't pay attention to diet at all. How many calories do you think he consumes? Four thousand at least, I'm guessing. He probably, my man, my man. He probably, <laughs> has, he probably has a reserve stall at Nathan Sanconi Island. That's like pretty much how much he eats. I'm guessing probably. I'm, I'm guessing probably at least three or four. I've read that that Joshua, uh, and we know how Joshua is built. And if you've seen his, any things of his clips on Instagram or whatnot, you see um, some of the workout he's done. I've read that when he's in serious camp. He burns as many as four to five thousand calories a day. You got to refill that up somehow in order to preserve uh, uh, weight and muscle. Uh, so I'm guessing with Big Baby, uh, he probably eats three, four calorie thousand calories a day at least. But he just doesn't put in the work to burn off the excess fat that that fighters like a Joshua does or whatnot. Put it this way. I would think that him and Dillian White puts in the same amount of work in the ring and in the weight room, but you notice that Dillian White, he's smaller, he's much more trimmer. Uh, it's what he eats, one, and it's the amount of ex extra cardio he does to keep his weight down because he's, he, he's a heavy weight lifter, too, but his body has changed. His body is um, different. His body has become – he has – become much more toned and, musc and, and muscular as well. in terms of big baby one he does he probably doesn't do any real serious cardio outside of sparring and two it's just how the amount of calories he eats plus he probably lifts a lot of weights to keep the bulk he his cardio he chases ice cream trucks i have it on good account and good and, and thing for him he's just and, and the thing that saves him is that he's naturally naturally athletic and he has natural stamina well, and it's he, interesting. He carries it all up high, really high. I mean, yeah. He's got big legs, though. He's got, he got really big, big legs. legs, though. He got big legs as well. Not that big. Not that big, though. No, they're pretty big. If you yeah. look at his look at his legs, they're pretty big. Yeah, they're they're, they're they're pretty big, and he does have a good athletic base. Like I mentioned, like he's athletic enough because he didn't just step into a boxing world overnight. Like he came from kickboxing, so he has. Yeah. No, he, he, he's surprisingly agile for a guy that big. 
he's been down as low as 242, but he's fought far more fights between the kind of 260 to 80 range. So, you know, a guy that big, yeah, it's 30 more pounds, but yeah. When it's fat and not muscle, yeah, it's it's a little bit of a difference. Like, yeah. Yeah. What, what, like if you want to see how a guy who's a similar height probably weighs more, but probably carries it a little bit more, it's very, very tough to go into as far as athletics, as far as combat sports, other than looking at strongman competitions, like I, right, like those Ironman right. competitions, and like the best example actually is a WWE guy, like the the guy competed in strongman competitions, like he, his name is Braun Strowman. The guy is I think is about as tall as Big Baby, weighs three hundred eighty five pounds, but you wouldn't tell by the way he shaped. He's shaped like a freaking back truck. That's what Big Baby needs to strive for. Like, if you're gonna go into this weight, you should be looking like a mat truck. But again, his his calling his it's not gonna work out long term for him. Um, he's gonna run into someone who can really punch, who can deal with his activity, um, who's gonna make him miss. Um, and the thing about Big Baby, he's had guys who 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 can. Who can, who he can cut the ring off against, who can he can hit on a consistent basis. What happens when he throws all those punches and he's gonna and a guy misses, and not only misses him but hits him hard, not just to the head and to the body. He's gonna be in some serious trouble. You know, I can't trust him. I can't trust him one bit in large part because of his weight. He didn't take his he didn't take um, fitness and conditioning serious at all. You can't I, I still want to see him though against the top heavyweights. I would. I still think he has a chance. The yeah, same lack. The same. The same lack of discipline that that does not make me trust um, Billy Joe Saunders makes me not trust him. I've seen Baby Miller. I've seen ba Baby Miller's. I think he's he's punch selection. He's combination, and he throws some very unorthodox comb. To me, he's he's in that sense he, he's better than all of the other heavyweights from what I've seen. I think he's got very good punch selection, punch variety, certainly inside the pocket, but he's a bit of an arm puncher. Yeah, that's the point. He's not a big puncher. Not really, when you really think about it, he's not that great of a puncher. He's not. No, but but to Gus's point, he does throw a good variance of combinations. Like I said, that goes again to his background. Like I said, he has a good solid base to go around. I think he knows his limitations as far as power I pro he probably does feel like he has to put on the weight in order to counter what he lacks in power okay i may not be able to hit as hard as a normal heavyweight or as an elite heavyweight but are you gonna is gonna take a hell of a lot for you to bring me down that's where he may be discounting on but the problem is you have a guy who is literally a hundred pounds lighter than you. Like I said, just an example, Deontay Wilder, who is very, very likely to do that to you. He's relying on being a weight bully. That's all. That's in yeah. short. That's what you mean. He's relying on being a weight bully. Yeah, that's what that, that's what it is. Like you're going to be bigger than that, and you can try to get away with it with somebody like Joshua, who, in a way, like he's he's fighting the way to carry himself with that with all that muscle. Going into it, and you can just say, "Oh, I'm big and naturally athletic." The problem, though, is eventually it will catch up to you. There's oh, weight issues always catch up to you, no matter what. Can you the imagine? Title, you, say again. Can you imagine him and Tyson Fury, the trash talking before the fight? It'd be world class. Oh dear Jesus! Oh, well, no. I considering the part of Brooklyn that big baby from. Yeah, that would be <laughs> glorious. <laughs> that would be glorious, but he wouldn't stand a chance. Well, the the fury pre the fury um up to the Klitschko fight would 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 toy with him. Yeah, would toy with him. Yeah, that's the that's where we have to differentiate when it comes to fury: pre Coke fury or post Coke fury. 
Dalia White would be a fun fight. I'd pay. I'd pay to see that. I, I would, think Deontay Wilder and Dillian White would be fun fights. Yeah. No, and he wants it. You know, he'll get it. He'll get it eventually. Um, let's move on to this final fight. Um, anybody uh, who watched it? I think you watched it, Gus. I can't remember or not. Uh, uh, no, Gail watched it. I know Gail watched it for sure. Um, Sarissa Kat Sorong was uh, coming back from his uh, uh, fight of the year candidate performance against um, Francisco Estrada. Returned to the ring fighting a guy by the name of Diaz. Um, I thought this was going to be a knockout for sure, but got to give Diaz some credit here. Uh, he fought hard um, throughout. Um, he stayed the course. He got wobbled a couple times. Uh, times. Uh, Rungwa side went to town on his body, but again, he proved, if anything else, um, Diaz proved to be one tough cookie. Surprising, surprising fight. Rungwa side was everything we've expected and seen from him. An incredible technician who can punch like a mule with stunning accuracy, and that's what makes him so dangerous. Iran Diaz put up a tremendous defense. Um, surprisingly, for a guy with two losses on his record, um, in, or three losses on his record, two of which were stoppages. Um, what it tells me now, and having seen him for the first time, um, that uh, you know, those had to be uh, hell, hell of tough guys for him to stop. I mean. It, it had to be perfect punches out cold for him to have not finished on his feet after watching him do so with Rungvisai. He he didn't threaten Rungvisai much, um, but he wasn't in there just running around the ring and or, or just simply taking shots like a punching bag either. He found ways to adjust during the fight. He did his best to find the openings he could. He did land punches on Rungvisai. But he simply couldn't do it with enough power and accuracy combined to really threaten him. But he kept Rungvisai honest. He kept up a really good effort. And if nothing else, Diaz deserves you know, another good matchup. It's just a tremendously impressive effort from him. He was not there just to get a paycheck. Rungvisai, though, is just... It's just brilliant. And in a way, it was nice to see him working all 12 rounds just to see his craft in action. He's just simply that good. But this, yo, tough chin, determination, took him all 12 rounds. Good for him. Indeed. And let's hope uh, now that this defense is over with, uh, we get to see Rungle side here stateside, possibly as part of a Superfly 4 card. Uh, who knows? Uh, Rungwasai has signed a, a pr big promotional deal with one championship. I believe that's the name of the promotional outfit. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gus. Um, he's going to be the the, the 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 name fighter on that new promotion. Those who don't know, one championship is a, a major, major promotional outfit in Asia, particularly when it comes to MMA. I believe it's the largest MMA uh, promotional outfit in the world. Uh, and they're event making a venture into the boxing game, um, so they're going to feature Rungwasai a lot. But again, hopefully we'll see him stateside again. Um, Can I just oh, make quick, two quick go, points, Mike, on that point? Go ahead, Gus. Yeah, I mean, one one of the defeats that um, that Diaz had was against a you know a very good fighter who are right, the former WBC um, hundred and was he a hundred and twelve pound champion Juan Navarrete. You beat a, if you remember, Mike, Nalpon Po Chokchai over in Yes, the, yes, yes, in yes. Thailand, yeah. We lost against um, the other Japanese. We, uh, we lost uh, against Christopher uh, Rosales. Yeah, I, I can't remember his name right now. His name is. Yeah, so that was, you know, I mean, one of, and I'm going to have to partially disagree with Gail a little bit. Rangavasai got dropped in this fight, which yes, was. Yes, he did. Yes, yeah, he did and, in round 11. Right, got a didn't. shot. You were and that, that reminded me of that yes, he he was, and he he did hit the canvas several times. All rule slips. Um, the referee was American Jay Nady. You know, some of those slips were a little suspect, if you ask me. But the, the, the one in the eleventh, you know, I mean, I I remember that. I remember it vividly. Sarisaget, who was you know pretty much walking him down, you know, fainted with the left hand. 
he tr- sorry, fainted with his right hand to try and draw Diaz. He 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 came in low trying to fire his left hand, a, a left cross. Diaz stepped back and came back with a short chopping right hand to the side of Srisikat's head. You could immediately see his head tip and his legs go. That was not a slip. He was hurt with that punch. And how the so it's all, needed a flip. Is needed. Yeah, though they were all ruled slips. They, there was no formal knockdown, no count administered. But you're absolutely right. Um, he did get tagged. It was it was truly a good fight. I mean, there it was. He was not just simply there to, like I say, co- collect the paycheck. I was very impressed. I will say overall with the production, with the card. It was very interesting to see a variety of combat sports in the ring all on one card. Um, they, they, they changed uh, different styles from bout to bout, and I, I found it extremely well done. And the commentators for the English language broadcast, um, the play-by-play man, um, and then the American color commentator, whose names unfortunately escaped me. Gus, maybe you can help me. They were excellent. Really, really good. So I wish them well. Let's move on to uh, some news here. Okay, got kind of cajoled into uh, talking about this. Uh, We all know all the boxing that was happening this weekend. However, uh, there was one MMA uh, bout that was on everybody's minds, um, including boxing fans' minds, too, if we're really going to be honest about it. Uh, Khabib um, and McGregor. Uh, we all know that McGregor, he ventured into boxing uh, last year, fought Mayweather, was stopped um, in round 10, where he went back into the MMA world, world to be specific, UFC 229, fought Khabib, one of the more um, highly anticipated match in UFC history. Uh, Khabib stopped McGregor in round four. He made McGregor tap out. Uh, as good as the fight was, what was most talked about is what transpired after the fight. Um, Khabib, as soon as he won, began engaging, talking to a member of McGregor's camp. Khabib, uh, like a cat almost, jumped out of the octagon into the crowd, A melee ensued into the crowd with uh, folks from McGregor's camp. A member of Khabib's camp leaped over the octagon, went in the ring, started pounding on McGregor. Uh, That has been the talk over the last couple of days. It reminded me of what I saw as a kid 20 years ago with uh, Bo Galata. Might as well talk about it now. Uh, Probable suspension for Khabib. Your reaction as boxing fans to what we saw from USC 229 with Khabib and McGregor? I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised at what happened because there was a lot of bad blood. You know, that's why I'm glad he lost. Not so much of what led up to the riot that happened when Floyd and Judah fought. But just the the level of the aftermath that got into it now. If you're looking at it from a pure like from a pure MMA standpoint, Khabib did what he was supposed to do. He was able to wear down McGregor. Didn't punish him as badly as Nate Diaz did. Nate Diaz beat the living crap out of McGregor. But he was able to make him get down on the mat and have him submit in Choco. Now uh, what Jacob mentioned, I think, before he got off a little bit, unfortunately, is that the, in the lead up to the fight, the, a lot of crap has happened. Remember, this all, a lot of it started when McGregor went in that tyrant in the bus in the Barclay Center. When he threw God knows how many things at that bus, wound up injuring a lot of. A couple of UFC fighters canceled a lot of fights, almost ruined a UFC card in general. And on top of that, talking about the Khabib's manager, talking about the situation 
in Russia, like Chechnya and Dagestan, talking about Khabib's family. And knowing that culture, that part of Russian culture where get granted people knew people know that the Russian Orthodox Church is a pretty big part of Russian culture. The vastness of Russia itself lends itself to a very, very large Muslim population. In the countries that in the countries that are into the Dagestan area, like Uzbekistan, Dagestan, Kazakhstan, and Khabibson is from that cloth. Like he he's a very hinter. He still lives in his parents' house because of religion. So I'm not surprised that he ultimately went off in that sense. I think, I think from what I know also that he hasn't been paid yet by the Nevada State Athletic Commission for the fight. And I think it'll ultimately be determined by them and not so much Dana White whether or not they strip the UFC strips him of the title. And it, it, it just was ugly. Like there were situations where Kans Khabib jumped the fence. McGregor, in the meantime, hit one of Kip, one of uh Khabib's team members before they retaliated on McGregor. It it was just uh, it was just an ugly way all around, but you know what? It got on Sports Center. It got people talking. And McGregor did exactly what you would think a showman would do after that. He started selling the rematch immediately. Uh, you could have an interest. We talked about this before, this before uh, we went live, Gus. You had an interesting observation, not just the the, the what happened when transpired afterward, but kind of a, a more in depth discussion when it came to come to uh, USC in general. Um, share that now, please. You know, Mike, when, I mean, I, I always felt that a melee would ensure after the fight. I was speaking about it with a number of UFC fans who were on the live chat. And uh, McGregor now, if he, he's been out of the ring for a significant period and during that sort of ensuing sort of, you know, two-year period, um, You've only got to look at the UFC's finances, their television ratings, their pay-per-view sales, and their annual budgets in terms of what they've been paying the fighters. And the, the product has been, you know, the number of stars they've had, you know, Ronda Rousey, you know, subsequently retired. You know, Brock Lesnar went back to the WWE. Then you had, you know, um, John Jones with his cocaine. So they've had a lot of combination of sort of you know failed drugs tests and uh, fighters leaving sort of retiring etc so there wasn't an, there wasn't too many marquee names it was only really daniel cormier who's been doing well you know winning light heavyweight heavyweight uh but not too much else and you know the, the pay-per-view ratings and, and the viewership has been coming down and um you know a lot of a lot of sort of ex-fighters fighting sort of you know for like 10 years have been highly critical of the product saying that it, it's no longer about personal rivalries. It's more about controversy. And that is, that is the line they're taking with certainly with, you know, the new shareholders and, um, you know, McGregor was talking about coming back as a partner as well. So I, I'm, I'm sure he has a tremendous amount of input into how, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of staging the events and the fights. And uh, to me, Mike, I, I think that was pretty orchestrated. The melee it's, Certainly out of character for for Khabib, but he but he's had those problems all the time. You know, being from Dagestan, you know the UFC has always been critical of him. You can hear even the commentators belittling him and his style of fighting, talking about how he just you know grapples round after round, but doesn't really do much. Doesn't have that killer instinct. So he's he's used to that criticism, you know, for at least ten, fifteen fights from what I recall. So so. If, Yes, there is that degree of pent up emotion, but for him to, you know, infringe that much, just totally lose it. No, I don't think so, Mike. You know, he's two million pound purse. He even got paid an absolute derisory amount uh, compared to what McGregor will get. They only disclosed three million, but somebody is saying that you know he he he'll make well over seventy five million for that. Uh, but they they're certainly not going to disclose that. They'll just 
they just revealed to the Nevada State Athletic Commission three million. But uh, you know they're they're pumping a lot of money into him. Um, yeah, they're going to try and definitely do a rematch, Mike. Because what else can they do? You know they've lift, recently lifted John Jones' suspension, so I, I guess he'll be back. You know, in a way. But apart from that, they don't really have very much, Mike. You know, it reminded me of when when Brock Lesnar came in the ring after, you know, the Daniel Cormier to sort of confront him. And and that's that's the uh, the line they're going at, Mike. It's, it's yeah, that, that, was, that 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 moment was just so obvious. I yeah. laughed. Yeah, and uh, it's not only my perception, Mike. A lot of ex fighters have been saying as well that they also felt that this was definitely planned you know, to create controversy, to create viewership, and then sort of entice you know for a rematch as well. And and I, I felt that straight away. I almost predicted there was going to be a fight after I was chatting it out. So. Um, if they want to suspend um, Khabib, I could understand. Um, if they want to strip him of his title, nah. Um, you can't, Dana White, you can't sit there and take as bad as that was uh, from, a, from the optics. You can't sit there and, and be so heavy handed on this guy when you did nothing uh, to McGregor when he went with, with the bus incident, uh, what he did, what he said, uh, probably orchestrated a, a deal so he wouldn't go to jail. Yeah, fake arrest. Exactly, Mike. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that, but then turn around and, and, and be so... Uh, Holier than thou, for lack of better phrasing, uh, when it when it when it comes to Khabib, um, I heard his ex. I heard what he said after the fight. While he was saying, "Well, I don't know why everybody's talking about this. Why everybody's talking about this?" Well, it just happened. That's why they're talking about it. However, outside of that, um, the way he explained himself was all the stuff that McGregor was going did to him beforehand. It ticked him off. He carried that anger before the fight. It fueled him in the fight and it, uh, after the fight in a way that's, you know, we saw what we saw. But still, yeah, you can't sit there and be so heavy handed and, and so self-righteous and, and, and with, with this dude when, you, when you've done nothing for Mac, to McGregor and you let him get away with all kinds of stuff, not in the lead up, to, not only in the, in the lead up to this bout, but in all all subsequent bouts since he became uh, popular. No, that's not going to work. Um, your thoughts, Gail? Sorry, I had to unmute the mic. You know, the ultimate revenge when somebody has trashed you, disrespected you, um, is to deliver the kind of beatdown Khabib did over McGregor. You know, it's that performance in the octagon that's the ultimate shut the fuck up statement. <laughs> he did not need to sully that by what happened after. Because that, speaking of the drop the mic moment, we talked about Inouye having that drop the mic ultimate moment in his performance. Khabib had a similar moment, and he didn't rest there. He didn't call attention to it. He immediately, unfortunately, diverted from it and sullied it, in my opinion, with what went on after. Now, Gus's theory about it being preordained, being scripted, being staged, um, I can see that. I think it was still a bad decision. I get it. They're cash poor. They're hanging on trying to survive. They're losing talent. Uh, but that is still such a desperate thing to do for short-term gain and, in my opinion, long-term harm. But here we are on the Pound for Pound Report talking about it. So, you know, who's the smarter operator? I'm not sure. I I'm very sorry it happened, however. And because of the religious uh, bigoted overtones, that disturbs me a bit too. Yeah. Um, so 
You had to. It was I couldn't really escape talking about it since it was talked about um, in all of the sports world, and it might as well uh, give our thoughts on it um, here uh, on Pound for Pound Box Report. Uh, back to the regular format with the boxing news. Um, we just had Canelo Alvarez uh, Triple G. Uh, Canelo won. A lot of people feel controversial uh, with the news regarding HBO. We were wondering what uh, Canelo would do with his next move and whatnot. We got the story. We got the news uh, over the weekend who Canelo will fight next. Rocky Fielding, y'all. Rocky damn Fielding. Really? I'm going to let y'all take over because um, um, starting with you, Jacob, because I know you went off on it on Twitter. Rocky Fielding, come on. This is, I, I'm, I mean, I'm disgusted by this. This is, you know, he, he, he's moved up to middleweight. He challenges for the belts. He has, you know, two fights. And first one draw, the next one, he gets a, a hold of two belts. And he elects to go up another division to fight probably the weaker of the – I think Rocky Fielding might have a belt or some type of version of the belt. But yeah, but just, this dude got blasted out by Callum Johnson, what, in a round? Yeah, uh, Callum Smith. Callum Smith, I'm sorry. Yeah, and but, I mean, this is perfect. This is a standard golden boy protecting their golden ticket stuff. You know, they, it's – they know that they can Canelo can sell sell fights. You know he can pack in an arena regardless of who he's fighting. You know he fought uh, with uh, Liam Smith, I think. Um, you know I thought maybe he was going to fight uh, Lemieux because Lemieux won his fight, and they are both Golden Boy fighters. But it's anything to not have to fight anybody. I think with with immediate danger, and we all know that you know the Triple G fight should have happened. You know. Uh, years ago, you know, and granted, however you scored that fight, if if, if any, if he's not gonna, if he wasn't gonna stay in that division, you know, I, I don't even know what what the whole point of that was. Like, you know, Canelo has always had a problem of, you know, he he made up his own weight class, you know, he's he knows that he's their cash cow, so he's he's basically in a, in a sense calling the shots. You know, I, I think he he knows that. With Golden Boy's finances uh, being revealed, uh, what was it a couple years ago? That he's their he's their guy. So whatever he says goes. So if he can keep on money, fighting easy fights, or you know, give me fights like this, then you know, I don't. It shows his true. You know, he thought about being Mexican and warrior and all this stuff, but uh, I don't see it. I'll just uh, let everybody else who wanted to uh, chime in on this, please do. And I'll, I'll say it again. Rocky Fielding, really? <laughs> Just don't insult me by putting up fights like this as a boxing fan. Rocky Fielding. You know, I will say this. I will say this. Canelo probably earned himself a layup fight, but... There are ways to do a layup, and there are ways to do a layup. Seriously, <sighs> yeah, this this is Oscar's gift to his. This is poor attempt at putting up, a, doing a layup. Yeah, yeah, that this is doing a layup while you're standing on about the fifth rung of a rad, of a ladder. Yeah, I I I know it's ridiculous. However, we all know the fight is looks to be staged in New York. It'll sell. Um, and then the big question is, who's carrying the fight? Who will carry this fight? And Canelo, from what I understand, has one more fight he owes HBO Boxing. But HBO Boxing is going out of business. Will they take a pass on this, leaving it open to bid? Um, the Zone USA is circling all over it, which then tells us about what's going down when somebody really gets serious about bidding um, with Golden Boy for broadcast rights. Is it going to be Showtime? I mean, Showtime would be smart. They'll get their investment back almost at any level if they pick him up. But will they? Will the zone 
lay out a lot of money so that they can own arguably the biggest draw in boxing right now. The way the chess pieces are all going to move around is very interesting. And, and I will say this fight does give everyone the opportunity to discuss, to be involved in some interesting business negotiations. Eh, but from a fan's perspective, very disappointing. Now, what also can happen that's, that's interesting, yes, Fielding has a minor belt. So, of course, Golden Boy will make a big damn deal about champion in three divisions, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what could happen is that Canelo could be stripped of his middleweight titles by the sanctioning bodies, and then they can let Golovkin and Charlo fight over him. And that would be very interesting. Uh, that, is, I mean, that is my question. I mean, you guys all in the media, why hasn't the WBC mandated, ordered Jamel Charlo and Canelo Alvarez, because if he's oh. the interim champion and he has been the interim champion for what, over a year and a half, or a year, whatever it is, I don't know what the hell it is. Now, if, if Golovkin was the previous title holder and he was the interim under him, and now that Golovkin has lost the fight and Canelo is the recipient of that belt, it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, Charlo is still the WBC interim champion and that fight should be ordered. He should not be in a position to be fighting the disposed champion for the right to fight the champion. That's a fucking nonsensical ruling. Gus, yeah, you know, okay, you're, okay. Gus, you're corruption in boxing. You know the answer to this. Yeah. 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 Gus, like you, you, you just question you already know the answer to, Gus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, come on, man. Come on, man. Like the Mexican sanctioning, one of the Mexican sanctioning bodies actually making the decision to benefit the Mexican. Come on, man. Yeah, but this begs the question, yeah. This begs the question, yeah. Is Al Heyman doing his job? Is Lou DeBella doing their job? All this to all this criticism that Jamal Charlo, that Eddie Hearn was trying to sign him. If their guys can't even get in that fight, then what the hell are they doing? They should be able to get in that fight. If that was Eddie Hearn, Eddie Hearn would have probably he's a he's a he's a snake in the grass, we know, but he would have probably got in the fight. Probably would have gotten in a fight, but that's that's the situation of it, and that's play, what plays into it when it comes to economics and this whole aspect of it. Yes, if they follow by their rules, they should have mandated the Charlo fight. Yes, if the WBA had some balls, they would have mandated Canelo Morata. You know, you you've only got to look at the the Vojtik and uh, Donna Stevenson before they even made the fight. They already stipulated that the winner of Vojtik and whoever he was fighting for the for the for the interim champion, and then that fight against the WBC champion Jack and Stevenson was automatically mandated that Adonis would have been stripped. So they already did that before he even became the interim champion. But Charlo, who has the belt for a year and a half, is still sitting holding his dick in his hand you know yeah but how it. long but how many years did it take for the wbc to finally get browbeaten into doing that several several yeah. the problem they've got with canelo is you know canelo told canelo told mauricio suleiman to kiss his ass yeah. so you know a few years ago and they have been running after him to try to make up kiss and make up all this time and they finally have done it they are going to do nothing to jeopardize that very, you know, very shaky relationship. Yeah. This is bull. And the thing is, Canelo and Oscar hold all the cards. Speaking of having somebody's anatomy and a vice, they I'm do. I'm sorry, but this is bullshit. This reminds okay, me. This, is, this, this reminds me. This reminds me of the way cons, uh, uh, Republicans in the House and Senate kiss up the Trump's ass. This is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let, well, let's first let's get into this fight. Let's get into this. And well, I, I don't first, mean to sound so. And I apologize oh, for God. using such harsh to? language. I apologize for using such harsh harsh language. But this is this is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Well, it is ridiculous in a way. Yes, if you put up a fight with Rocky Fielding, okay. I only get it from this sense. I only get it from this exact sense. The title doesn't mean shit to me because it's a secondary title. The WBA champion is Callum Smith. The only makes sense is, okay, you want Canelo to fight in December, but you don't want him to have that tough of a training camp. Okay, you make a fight a super middleweight where he doesn't have to make the weight, where he probably is already going to get there anyway sooner or later. 
I get it from that sense. That's the only way I get it. Okay, you okay, you can have not a rough training camp. You'll be able to make this way, and it's against the guy who really won't matter much, but it'll make you money. It'll get your it'll get your New York fans in the arena. And you'll still be over time because in the meantime, with the WBA, like I said, they, they could to, they could tomorrow, if they have some balls, sanction Murata, order the Murata fight, which would wouldn't be a bad fight. Canelo versus Murata right now would not be a bad fight. Hell, he should Canelo be fighting Charlo. Yeah. Bottom line, he should be fighting Charlo. No, Gus is no. right. Yeah. If you're going by that round, yeah, I would I would love to have that fight. Like, but like, like again, it's the Mexican sanctioning body making a decision to benefit the Mexican fighter, especially the Mexican fighter that like like Gail mentioned, pretty much told them to go fuck themselves. When they tried to make him to fight Golovkin on their terms, yeah. and he and he made it stick, and they know it, and yeah, they that, know. The, and that's that's the bad thing about it. This is just a pure power play, and HBO's probably not going to cover it because, I see from my understanding, like that contract is done. And well, for a lot of reasons, you know, they they're 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 just winding things down. You know, it's like when you see a business closing, you know, and the store starts to shrink and the inventory starts to fit in one corner, you know, that's what we've got going on. They'll dribble out a few more fights this year. You know, it's, it's a big question mark, which one is going to in theory be the very last fight, um, you know, which will be for posterity, uh, a little moment in history, but yeah, I don't think it's going to be Canelo. Not a chance. No, because if you finish on Canelo, that's that's pretty bad. Yeah, but th don't you think the WBC is chasing? So they're trying to make good with Canelo, but what Cotto did with the sanctioning fees, he dropped the belt. He didn't drop the, one of the belts. To, to, I'm not paying those sanctioning fees. The thing, well, there's nothing to say that he won't do that just to keep his money and just say, oh, fuck you, WBC. I don't care if you, like, you put everything in my favor. I'm not paying those sanctioning fees. Because it wasn't about the sanctioning fees with, oh, with Cotto, yeah. yeah with Cotto, it, it was about the sanctioning fees. With Cotto, it was just a pure business move in that sense. With Canelo, it's just about power. Okay. It's just, yeah, nobody needs to go, you know, put up a Kickstarter campaign for Canelo to pay the fees. That is not what it's about <laughs> at all. Well, did Oscar Oscar paid for him though? That that was the thing. I, well, if I remember it correctly, Oscar ended up paying for him, but Canelo did not want to pay those fees. Well, that that's Oscar, you know, trying to go along to get along, keep everybody happy. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, if, if Canelo really wanted to, you know, cover Oscar, he could say, "Listen, take it, you know, take it out of my account, or you know, give me, you know, I'll, 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 I'll reimburse you, what, whatever it is." It's. It's not about that. This is Canelo throwing his weight around in more ways than one. And if, and if hypothetically, I mean, in the million years, the WBC had ordered the fight between Alvarez and, and Charlo, Canelo wouldn't have taken the fight. We know that. So the Absolutely. WBC would have, Canelo would have vacated the WBC belt. But as Charlo is holding the interim, Charlo would have automatically been given that he would automatically be the WBC champion with me, even having to fight in the final eliminator. So, um, and if you're, you're going to drop the belt, if you're going to lose the belt anyway, why not say, kiss my ass, you know, go ahead, take it back versus having it taken from you. There's, there is a difference. There is quite a difference. And does that then set him up for the WBC to make nice to him down the road next year? In the future, possibly. Mm. As I've said it before, boxing is about two things, Vaseline and wire payments. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And let's uh, move on. And let's move on on that note to some other news. Um, quick reaction, guys, to the fact that Tyson Fury has yet to 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 uh, sign up for VADA testing um, for his upcoming bout against Deontay Wilder. I'm actually I'll, shocked. Uh, I, I'll. I'll do it. I'll put it to the way in the corniest way that I can. Baking soda. He's got baking soda. <laughs> <laughs> quick word. Quick word from you, Gus, on this news. Um, you know, Mike, I've 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 been long investigating this whole Tyson Fury drugs issue in the past, and I and I get the feeling that he's failed Nandrolone test was covered up by the British Boxing Board of Control, UCAD, and Tyson sort of engineering a an injury rather than face the consequences. So um, I, I don't know, Mike. I, I, I'm glad if, if, if they're going to be putting him through rigid drug testing, then then good, so be it, because he, he's got away with, I think, quite a lot in the past. Uh, one more and I'm going to leave Gail out of this conversation uh, on purpose because uh, she has an association with um, main events. But the news is that broke uh, yesterday, Dan Rayfield uh, discussed it, uh, talked about it first with ESPN, that um, there are rumors uh, about NBC uh, getting back into the boxing game um, with the with boxing now no longer being on HBO uh, following this year, uh, rumors are, are are popping off that uh, NBC is working uh, on a deal with main events to carry boxing um, on that network. So you again you have boxing back on main on NBC on um, network television, um, and again because of conflict of interest, uh, I want to leave Gail going to leave Gail out of this discussion. Um, so I'll just have the discussion with uh, 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 Daniel and Jacob and Gus. If you want to chime in, please do. Your reaction to the possibility of uh, uh, a venture boxing uh, venture with uh, NBC in main events. Reunited, and it feels so good in a way. Because they did have a previous deal before. It was mainly through NBC, I said. So they've so main events and NBC have had a macabre relationship, and this is actually a really smart move when it comes to when it comes to Kat to do when going into it. Well, let me you say know, that. Let me say, let me interrupt, Daniel. Conflict of interest is the wrong word with Gail. Let's just say because of her association with main events, I don't want to um, put her. I don't. I want to leave her out of discussion because uh, again, she works. She does uh, promotional work with. Main events does promotional work with her company, so it would be unfair to kind of put this on her, given her association. Proceed on, Daniel. Oh no, and that's very fair. Like I said, that's that's fairness. In uh, well, and, and I will say, I am capable of saying I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> in that sense, in, the, in that sense, but that's but the interesting part of it, I've always said, is when it comes to main events, when in that when I looked into it is they're survivors. That company is full of survivors. They've survived the Patriarch's death. They've survived some of their champions losing pretty badly. That they're they're they'll survive Kovalev losing pretty badly. So it's a next set it's it is smart. Everybody's Finding their own base to do it in. Like I said, they still have that relationship with Golden Boy. In fact, I, I think the Solomon Burr and Monaghan fight is going to be part of that partnership with Golden Boy for Facebook Watch. So, it's and, very and, and that I can confirm, and that is on for the third yep. of November. Yeah, uh, in in Brooklyn. Yep. Yep. And that's. Like I said, and it's a smart. Like I said, it's smart to already just when you think one avenue ends that you know you've always left 
a window open somewhere. And that's pretty much what it, uh, this was. Like, okay, HBO is getting out of the boxing business, and you're just spreading your wings. Okay, you, you've you seen ESPN grab the alvarez Kovlev rematch. Doesn't mean you have to be tied to Bob Arum. Doesn't mean you have to be tied to ESPN. You can find your own deal. And particularly NBC, if they go back to the avenue of just being NBCSN, for the most part, It'll work wonders for the organization as well, because then they can act. They'll have the means to fully fund like local boxing back in New York, and bring real big, real good local cards on a regular basis back to Atlantic City, not just the big fights. And then get fights in Connecticut, get fights. Upstate, it opens up a whole plethora of avenues for them to rebuild their regional base. I'm old school. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, uh, 80s, 90s, watching boxing just on straight NBC. Um, I would love to see that again um, because there's no NFL, uh, because there's no NBA, because there's no Major League Baseball. There's a spot there on NBC and the spot has always been there uh, to cover boxing. The question is um, the bouts, what kind of what kind of level in terms of fights do they bring towards the table? If they can bring good quality bouts to the table, I think it could work uh, not just on M in NBC um, Sports Network, but just straight NBC as well. Uh, it may have to be a seasonal thing, you know, spring, summer, or summer, early fall, or whatnot, how they do it. But still, um, now I'll go to you, Jacob. I think there's a spot there for it to be just on straight NBC. Uh, your thoughts, Jacob? Particularly if it's like on the weekends, like on a Saturday or a Sunday. Your thoughts? Oh, see, Jacob was left. So uh, uh, he had to dip. Um, I think he had to dip because he had to leave early. Uh, I'll go to you, Gus. Any reaction to the fact that um, here in the States there's a possibility for boxing to be back? Well, it, it is on with Heyman and his stuff, but another avenue in terms of terrestrial, as we like to call, a network television. So so this potential deal wouldn't be a time buy. This would be a contract, an NBC paying main events. Is that correct? From what I understand, yes. Okay, now how, how how does how does the NBC network mean in terms of how does that work? In, is that is that a um, is that on the cable network or or what? No, it's not on the cable network. Any and everybody, whether you have cable or not, you can get it. It's like okay. BBC. It's like it's like BBC. BBC. It's like BBC over in the UK in England. Okay. Excuse me. Yeah, it it would okay. be like I would probably compare BBC to Channel Four in the UK. Uh, Am I right, that Because from when I'm, NBC have the overseas rights to the to the um, the English sort of the Barclays Football Premiership because I can see that Saturday three o'clock games are being shown on them. NBC actually show those games live. Yeah, the um, EPL um, and yeah. the Olympics. Yep, they have the Gary yeah. Olympics. They don't have as much of a grip on the Premier League anymore because ESPN Plus is starting to eat into that. What 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 sort of, what sort of uh, what sort of television numbers were they getting for that? Uh, for the Premier League, although no, they were getting yeah. big, they were getting decent numbers. Like that's one of the things that's kept NBCSN afloat because they mm -hmm. put a lot of English Premier League games into that network. Mm -hmm. What the, what it is mainly is what's probably important about when it comes to NBC of it is because they're willing to spend money like they, they just they just gave WWE a crap load of money to keep raw in the USA network yeah because Smackdown's that, going to Fox isn't it yeah yeah and yeah. and you add that into the fact that like I said they're they're supposed to where they're trying to get back into the NBA there's they still have some some hockey coverage they still have some NHL coverage, and I think they do. I think on NBCSN they do the premier, they do the American, the Arena Football League. 
So the, they, other, the other thing NBCSN covers is NASCAR. Yeah, yeah. So they do and um, Formula Formula Racing. NASCAR, Formula One, um, yeah. Diamond League track series, and track and field as well, Gus. Uh, and professional cycling, the major, um, uh, you know, the big, the, the big, big uh, races, the Tour, the Vuelta, the Giro are all televised, in addition to some of the um, same-day races. So it's, it's a very interesting sort of hodgepodge. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Actually, interesting enough, they, they'll be a lot closer to you, Gus, because... Their parent company, Comcast, just won that bid to for Sky Sports, if I remember correctly. They outbid Fox. I think for Sky Sports and Sky Network in general. The yeah, Sky, the uh, Broadcasting Corporation, yeah. Mm -hmm. the parent company, yeah. yeah. So yeah, like I said, uh. Rumors start about it. I uh, hope to hear some more um, dropping in the future. And um, yeah, uh, power for power, we'll keep you updated on it. I'm hoping it happens because again, uh, more boxing, more better. Particularly if the bouts are, bouts are um, um, high quality and with main events, um, I think we can get that. I think we can get that. So let's hope uh, something um, is finalized and something is finalized soon. Let's move on to um, do some previews of, the, of some fights that's coming up this weekend. I want to focus on two fights. Um, first fight being um, Terrence Crawford uh, uh, beat Jeff Horn earlier this summer to uh, win a belt at welterweight, making his first defense of the WBO welterweight belt title, excuse me, against uh, Jose Benavidez. Benavidez, excuse me. Uh, very much a grudge match here. Uh, these two do not like each other. Um, I'll go back to you, Gail, I'll get you back into the conversation. Uh, your thoughts on uh, Crawford and Benavidez. I think Crawford will win and will win quite handily. Um, we all know about Crawford's main streak. I think we will see that main streak once again in this fight. Absolutely you will. I'm not sure we'll see a 72nd um, Inouye-style monster performance, but I don't think it will be all that long. Opponents tick off Bud Crawford at their peril. You do not need to make him any more pissed in the ring, any more focused than he already is. He feeds on this stuff. And great boxers do have that Mr. Hyde mean streak they can count on and call on in the ring, regardless of what their personality is like outside. And sometimes there's a real dichotomy between who that guy is you might see on the street or ringside when he's not engaged versus that switch that turns on and i've never seen anyone do it quite like bud crawford and it's part of what makes him such a great fighter boxing is so mental and be to be able to call up that emotional fuel at will is a tremendous skill and very rare and he's got it and we're going to see it. And we're going to enjoy it. Uh, Daniel, Gus, uh, you give uh, Benavides any kind of a chance here? I don't personally. Are you there, fellas? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I, I was saying was, uh, do you give Benavides any kind of a chance here? Personally, I don't. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. Isn't isn't Benavides coming back from some sort of a recovering from some sort of a shooting? Was it was it him or was it somebody else? I'm not sure. Uh, Gail, uh, Daniel, do you know the answer to that question? I swear to you, he was involved in the shooting or something about a year ago or something. Uh, it, that's true, but it's it's been some time ago. I mean, time flies. It was actually in August 2016. Um, oh not yeah. terribly serious. Hospitalized after I think what were called at the time, uh, you know, non-life threatening injuries. 
um, kind of a random thing apparently was walking down the street in his own neighborhood someone approached him stranger asked him a question uh, apparently he didn't either get the answer he wanted or was just setting him up and um, fired at him and things seems to have re resolved so you know people in the boxing um, do not always come from the nicest parts of the community that's <laughs> just the way it goes but he he's yeah. it is not a factor in this fight when was well, he uh, not a, in the that's not a factor into it and last little tip that involved the dog i think it involved the pit bull i think <laughs> well <laughs> so so there it is yeah there, there's that factor but no i i don't give a chance i i don't give Benavides a chance. Uh, he's been talking a lot of crap to Crawford, and it's been and it's been going on for years. This is when they were both when Benavides was still in top rank. So I don't see any chance. Like you mentioned, it, Mike Bud has the mean streak, and Bud doesn't forget. He's like an elephant in that area. He does not forget. And he's not going to forget the comments that Benavides has made three years ago regarding him and when they were at 140 pounds. So this is this is a good chance to get at them. It's a decent defense, like a first defense, because then you get that out of the way. And ultimately, you're just trying to bide your time before either goad somebody from the PBC to cross over and fight you or like I said try to try to pull out Bob's original plan and have Pacquiao fed to you um yeah this fight is taking place uh in Crawford's hometown of Omaha uh, on ESPN so yeah you can see it on ESPN not ESPN plus or anything like that uh, last and final fight I'm going to go to here is uh, another part, the second bout of the uh, World Boxing Super Series uh, Bantamweight Tournament. We began the show talking about Naoya Inoue. Um, this fight, particular fight that we're going to talk about now is featuring um, Zolani Tete. I'm going to you, Gus, on this one. Uh, fighting a fighter by the name of Alawan. Um, Tete is the better fighter. He's the more talented fighter. On balance, he should win. However, should am I wrong being uh, a bit concerned that Tete is fighting um, Alawan in his home country on um, enemy territory in Russia? Yeah, th th there's definitely some degree of concern there, especially if Tete has been. We've seen with when he fought Roman Navias and, and some of the other fights, he's just been fighting at that one pace comfortable in, in systematically outboxing the opponents who clearly didn't want to engage too much as well. So um, he, he's going to have to be careful fighting at just sort of one pace, relying on that and, and trying to win you know, the judge's decision because uh, it, it's, it's not going to be to his advantage. Now, the Russians are definitely investing in anyone who, I think it might only be his fourth or fifth fight. I don't even recall, but he's... I believe he had a this is just his fifth fight, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So he had a long amateur career. Fought a couple of reasonably... He fought one or two very good fighters, but a lot of them were just state and regional levels. It was a bit, a little bit like Dimitri Bevel, Mike. You know, people go on about his... But Bevel never really ventured into the sort of world... Uh, European ranks, it was very much state and regional fighters who he predominantly fought for. You know, I think about 210 of those fights. So you've really got to analyze the records properly to sort of gauge the level of opposition. But um, from what I can gauge, he doesn't have too much power, Mike. Uh, he can box. Not a bad counter puncher as well. Uh, Tete can definitely punch, so he does have that, have that ability you know, where he can um, but you know, I don't know what it is with the fighters. Just don't take too much chances with him, uh, because he can he can punch and he can box. 
I think he has to be aggressive in this fight, Mike. I think he's going to have to. Um, I wouldn't say be too, a little bit too reckless, but I think um, having height and reach, and he has good feet as well. Uh, I, I think, from what I've seen in the amateurs, Mike, I think the Russian Elwan is is definitely vulnerable to the body. I've seen him. Um, he was put down. Uh, who was it? Moroccan guy. So I think I think the body attack is definitely his weakness. I think it was at Southpaw as well who who gave him trouble. So I think hopefully Teddy would have studied that. Um, I think he can, I think he can get him at short range. Um, not that good when you when you back him up as well, Mike. He's not. I didn't see too much ability there. He's very good on his front foot, back foot, not as much. So I think it'd be wise for Teddy to press the action, mate. Try and walk him down, you know, at short range, work the body, could stop him. But I, 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 I but I don't know whether Teddy is going to be that that aggressive, Mike. You know, it, it's uh, chances are he's going to just probably not take too much risks and try and outbox his opponent at long range. So um it's 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 very difficult to sort of gauge his mindset and his tactics on the fight, but um he should win, Mike. I think he's the, the far superior boxer. Um but who knows what he's gonna do. Um Daniel Gale, quick word on this bout. Well, Tete's longer, Tete's faster, Tete is the better technical skilled fighter out of the two. There is some worry, like you never know, but you know what? Russian yeah. fighters have taken some pretty big L's in their home country of late, whether it's been Gassiev, or it's Ternovsky, like we mentioned when it came to Ndongo. So there, it's not so much that there's ample little room for corruption. It's just the mere fact that you, you just worry about what would happen pre the fight, but I think Tete will take care of business. He'll take care of it quickly because you know he pays attention to the rest of the tournament. He knows what Inoue did. He won't probably try to top it as far as timing, but he'll probably try to top it in terms of domination. Yeah, well, the, the you cited the Ndongo fight. Uh, Ndongo didn't let it go to the scorecards. Tete cannot let it go to the scorecards. That, that's the only way you control your own fate when you're on enemy territory like that. And I, I would have my doubts in even uh, a slightly, anything even slightly close going to the cards puts Tete in a really bad spot. Mm -hmm. um, because Tete, he got, he got stiffed by the judges when he was, where was it, in Argentina? That's right. Mm. That's right. You know, yeah. unless he scores a knockout, uh, you know, he he's he's crafty, but he's not particularly flashy. You know, so I I think it would be a problem. I, you know, and the truth is, all of us on this panel want to see Inoue and Tete, but the truth is, it doesn't really matter because Inoue's going to win this tournament in the end. I mean, so, you know, sort of like World Cup. You know, there's certain teams that you know should advance, but are they going to win in the end? Nah. I'm, I wouldn't hold out Tete now if he brings his A game. I admire your loyalty, man. If he if he brings his A game, he's going to give um he's going he's going to give in a way um a damn good fight. Hey, any given day, any given bout, absolutely true. Um, one last fight that I I, I want to talk about right quick, and I'll go right to you, Gail. Uh, uh, we talked about French on Cruz, uh, her winning a, a belt at 168, uh, and her story. Um, uh, want to give a quick shout out to, uh, Jessica McCaskill. She was part of that design card, um, in Chicago and on home in on home turf. Uh, she won a world title, uh, defeating Jessica for Fer for uh, to win the, uh, junior welterweight title WBC version. Um, uh, McCaskill gave, uh, Katie Taylor, um, a real, real tough fight. Uh, quick word, Gail, on, 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 um, Jessica McCaskill, uh, winning a world title. 
I'm glad you uh, are, are giving her a little visibility. You know, she just got a terrific personal story. She was homeless as a child, and now she is the WBC <clears throat> junior welterweight champion. <laughs> <laughs> but she did defeat the reigning um, world champion um, in Farias. She was not intimidated. She walked her down. Uh, she made it a pretty rough fight actually over over 10 rounds uh the scores were um varied they were as wide as 98 92 they were as narrow as 96 94 but unanimous decision for her and, and i did think the wider scores were the fairer scores you know she get herself back into another showdown with uh katie taylor who's going to be fighting in boston here in a couple of weeks she's certainly uh doesn't mind fighting here in the united states where she's training um, you know, good for McCaskill, and I understand uh, if I if I read correctly, she is the first um, women's professional champion from Chicago. So good for her, winning in front of the hometown fans. Indeed, I think we're going to uh, start. Uh, we're going to sh shut the show down on that note. Um, I want to thank um, me, myself, and I, um, Sergio. Uh, for joining us in the live Facebook chat. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you like what you've heard, uh, please hit that like button. Uh, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, please subscribe to us on iTunes as well as uh, SoundCloud. Um, I want to thank Jacob who joined us on the show earlier. Jacob from Japbook Boxing. Um, if you want to check him out, talking boxing, talking movies, he's a frequent guest on the Wrong Real uh, podcast or podcasts that discusses movies. You can check him out on Twitter at J-R-A-T-M-2-3. Uh, so if you want to check him out, talking boxing and movies, J at J-R-A-T-M-2-3 on Twitter. Uh, Gail from Community Digital News, for those who want to talk uh, the sweet science, for those who want to talk dancing with the stars, Game of Thrones, small business advice, environmental issues. She does just about it all. She, she does just about everything. Uh, <laughs> let, let the folks know where they can find you. Well, I don't talk about restaurants or technology, but uh, that, <laughs> that, that, that'll leave that alone. But wherever I'm talking and whatever I'm talking about, you can find me at Communities Digital News, where my regular column runs, and that is com, C-O-M-M, digi, D-I-G-I, news, comdiginews.com. And on the Twitter and on the gram, it's PR Pro San Diego. Uh, Gus from Corruption and Boxing, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk music, let the folks know where they can hit you up. Are you there, Gus? Yeah, sorry about that. I was on mute. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Pleasure as always. Um, Boxing-wise, uh, Corruption in Boxing, YouTube. Um, Music-wise, I... It's the sort of area that I've been focusing a lot more, um, become real, unfortunately, a bit of a boxing recluse. Um, but the music side is going very well. I'm starting to do work for uh, Bandcamp as well, who release a lot of sort of music for artists. A lot of my reviews are being posted up on there. So, so yeah, Bandcamp, Juno Records, and, and Beatport. Um a lot of artists and labels are starting to reach out to me, so my journalistic skills were appealing to them quite a lot, so that that's good. Um, a lot of the music I do, I've got about 770 reviews. Uh, I've put them all on, on YouTube. The channel is a covert operative. Indeed, indeed. And then last but certainly not least, not least, Daniel from The Inscriber, for those who want to talk The Sweet Science, for those who want to talk The NBA's in particular when it comes to the Miami Heat. Let the folks know where they can find you. You can find me. Sorry, okay. Yes, folks, you can find me on Twitter, Rox99. And you can definitely catch me like some folks before Boxing News when we put up the show. Hopefully we'll be able to put it up tomorrow. The weekend got a little bit busy. And, yeah, covering boxing, covering the heat. Tibbs, just just give us a trade, man. And oh dear God, no, Gail, no, no. I think what Daniels is reacting to was in the chat that the WBC <laughs> has apparently um, ordered a fight between um, Jorge Linares and um, Adrian Broner. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm incredibly 
disappointed in this. Just, oh, that's a shake your, that's a shake my head moment if there ever was one. And, yeah. and, and I apologize for ending a great show on that note. Nah, no problem. You know, sometimes you got to talk about that. Let me see. Broner can't make no 140. He's not trying to make 140. Um, for those who want to talk uh, boxing, for those who want to talk musical fitness, you know what it is on Twitter, Brother JR at Brother JR76. As I said to begin the show, if you want to find out all things regarding Pound for Pound Boxing Report, blog page is the place to go to, P4P Boxing Report. Uh, dot wordpress.com that's the link check the right of the page you'll find the links to all our channels all over social media as well as channels where to listen to, links where to listen to the show on everything that carries podcast minus spotify um on the next episode we will do a recap of crawford benavidez we will do a recap of tete and alawan a fight we didn't mention um fight is going to happen on facebook watch uh, so you'll be able to see this fight angel acosta versus abraham rodriguez is going to be on facebook you can catch it there fight Beautiful. is also taking place saturday um in las vegas uh we will do a recap of all those fights um and we will do a preview of uh, a whole lot of boxing that's happening on the 20th uh Rota morada he's going to defend his belt at 160 against rob brandt that's going to be on espn plus in las vegas uh, Billy Joe Saunders, Demetrius Andrade. We all know the chaos and controversy in the lead up to that. Um, that's going to be on the zone in Boston on the undercard. Katie Taylor, she's going to defend her two belts. Tevin Farmer is going to fight on the undercard as well, uh, as well as Kit Galahad and uh, Scott Quigg. Um, the third bout of the Bantamweight tournament. No, 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 no. I'm going. I'm going ahead of myself. I'm going ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Um, I'm way ahead of myself. Uh, so yeah, we, yes, that's right. We will do a recap of, we'll do a recap of the fights on the 13th and a preview of the fights on the 20th. Murata Brandt, uh, Billy Joe Saunders, Andrade, Katie Taylor, Serrano, Tevin Farmer, Kit Galahad, Scott Quigg, um, Emmanuel Rodriguez fighting Jason, Mal Jason Maloney, a fight I really like. Um, as the third battle of the Bantamweight Tournament World Boxing Super Series, um, Dortico's is going to fight on that undercard as well. So, yeah, we're going to be previewing a whole lot of boxing that's going to be happening on the 20th. So, yeah, uh, for uh, Gail for Communities Digital News, for Jacob of um, Jab Hook, Gus from Corruption and Boxing, Daniel from The Inscriber, I'm your host, Michael. This has been episode 225 of the Pound for Pound Box Report. Um, everyone have a good evening. Um, good night.